I'm John Banther, and this is Classical Breakdown. From WETA Classical in Washington, we're your guide to classical music. In this episode, I'm joined by WETA Classical's Evan Keeley, and we're talking about possibly one of the most interesting people of the 18th century, Joseph Bologna, Chevalier de Saint-Georges. We explore his extraordinary life as one of Europe's greatest fencers, a violin soloist, composer, military man, plus the musical characteristics to listen for in his music, and stay with us to the end as we read your reviews from Apple Podcasts. We know him mainly as a composer today because that's the only way we can really interact with his music, right? By playing it, by hearing it. But as we'll learn, Bologna was doing a whole multitude of things. He was a military man, a serious champion fencer, a conductor, not to mention a violin soloist in addition to being a composer. It seems like, Evan, there's just so much going on at times in his life. Music may have been one of the lesser interesting things even. Yeah, this is such an interesting and heroic figure. Uh, There's so much about him that's so appealing. He seems to have really remarkably excelled at just about everything he put his mind to, whether it was fencing or playing the violin or composing or as a military man. Uh, So he's quite this brilliant and accomplished figure. And yet there's also a lot of unanswered questions and a lot that we can't be sure about. Yes. And in fact, there is a movie coming out about Bologna's life, and it features an original score in part because I think, well, a lot of his music is lost, as we'll hear. A lot of his music has been lost to time, so there's an original score. And if you've already seen it, if you're listening to this later, let us know um, what you think about it. I'll definitely be checking that out. Yeah, it will be interesting to see this film uh, about this very appealing figure and the extent to which it uh, embellishes what we know about him or not. Yes. Let's start with the basics, his name, because it's it's quite long and intriguing. Joseph Bologna, Chevalier de Saint-Georges. That is that is quite fancy sounding. Kind of a puzzling, uh, even what to call him becomes a little confusing. Mm-hmm. Uh, co- the conductor James Conlon, who conducted a performance with the Los Angeles Opera of his one surviving opera, had this to say. There's not even universal agreement as to the, his name's correct spelling, Uh, It's spelled variously in different ways. And then uh, Maestro Conlon goes on to say, uh, is the addition of the title Chevalier de Saint-Georges, is this a title or is that his name? In fact, his father, a member of the minor aristocracy, seems to have borne a title. But French law denied both illegitimate children as well as black persons from inheriting the name or rank of nobility. As time went on, he seems to have referred to more often as Saint-Georges and often signed his name that way. So that's what James Conlon has to say about the name. And so I think, John, as you and I are talking about this fascinating figure, we might go back and forth and call him Joseph Bologna. We might call him the Chevalier de Saint-Georges or just Saint-Georges, but they're all (laughs) referring to the same person. Yes, and chevalier, that's like, um, that means knight in French, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's like a title. So, Joseph Bologna, Chevalier de Saint-Georges, he was born in Guadeloupe, December 25th, 1745, at the time, a French colony in the Caribbean. His mother was an enslaved Senegalese woman known to us only by the name Nanon, and she was probably around 16 years old when Bologna was born, Joseph Bologna was born. She was a maid to the wife of Joseph's father, and as we know, Evan, this was not unusual, as we know from our own history. Less common was for the fact that a father in this situation would acknowledge, and then even more uncommon, and what happened here is San George's father acknowledging him, not just that, but also really um, being there for him and supporting him financially and his education. Yeah, it's a story full of contradictions. So his father was a French man, a white man, and an enslaver. He was a planter. He owned a plantation on Guadeloupe, and he enslaved this uh, teenage girl, among others. We don't know how many people he enslaved. Uh, He had a child with her, and as you've said, John, this is unfortunately not an unusual thing with the uh, enslavement of people from Africa over the centuries. But as you said, it's unusual that he acknowledged the child. Not only did he acknowledge this child, but that he actually supported him and wanted him to get a good education. And his education would start pretty early, right? He's like seven years old when his father sends him to Paris. 
Right. He sends him off to Paris to a really good school. Clearly, we don't know what the sums are, but investing a considerable sum of money to do this. So again, acknowledging that he had this illegitimate child. He was already married to somebody else, of course. So there's layers of uh, really unethical conduct on the part of uh, Joseph's father, who nevertheless also, in addition to doing these terrible things, does a good thing by supporting this, this son that he fathered. And it's at this school where he's introduced to presumably a whole host of, uh, of topics and, and subjects, one of them being fencing. And he excelled extraordinarily at fencing. And it's something today, it's like every four years it pops back up when, you know, the normal common people like us watch uh, the Olympics and then we um, see fencing. So he was at a young age um, doing that. And then there was this kind of showdown, right, between Alexander Picard, who was this um, fencing master, and I think this is really depicted, this is a big part of the movie, and Bologna was like 17 years old, uh, Picard was older, and it became this kind of taking sides, those for slavery and and those against it, um, on Bologna's side or on Picard's side. In the end, Bologna, I guess, just wiped the floor with this guy. Well, yeah. So this guy, Picard, uh, it became, uh, you know, you think about boxing matches in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, Muhammad Ali became this figure, this uh, representation of uh, a black person overcoming a racist system. And uh, I I can't help but see that as a kind of an analog to this situation with young Joseph Bologna, who very quickly develops this reputation as a master fencer. This other, this guy Picard challenges him and people take sides and uh, young uh, young Joseph Bologna uh, defeats him in a fair match and uh, he really proves his worth in a situation where a lot of people doubted him because of his background, because of his skin color. Uh, and uh, he, really, he really showed them who was, uh, who was the most skilled. I can only imagine what the scene would have been like at that uh, that fencing match. And people might be wondering, now Bologna, who's uh, born in Guadeloupe, he's gone to Paris, he studied at the school, fencing, everything we just said. We've not even mentioned music yet, and that's because we don't have anything, I guess at this time at least, that points to him being a musician before 1764, before he's 19 years old. It's this year, 1764, when kind of all of a sudden we see two violin concertos dedicated to Bologna, written by Antonio Lolli, who may have also been his violin instructor. It's quite interesting. Nothing, and then this out of the blue, and then just two years later, another kind of thing like this, where Francois-Joseph Gosek, a great composer, dedicated a set of string trios to, uh, to Bologna. Yeah, there's so much we don't know about how he got into music and where his early instruction was or with whom. But again, what we do see pretty clearly is it was one of the many things at which he immediately excelled. And so just a few years after this, he kind of takes a path that, well, I think many people still do today as a musician. That is, he joins an orchestra, I think 1769, 1771. He moves from just being in the violin section to being concertmaster. And then in 1773, he's appointed conductor of, if I can say it correctly, Le Concert de Sematur, this um, orchestra. Um, He was appointed by that composer we mentioned, Gosek. And so we see this upward rise from him, like we do today, a violin section member, concertmaster, to conductor, and also now in the 1770s composing. Right. And it's not clear exactly what his relationship was with Gosek, but I find that particularly fascinating. Gosek himself is is an interesting topic, lived a very, very long life, 1734 to 1829. Wow. As a young man, he had uh, worked with Jean-Philippe Rameau, and then he lived through the classical period and into the romantic period. So clearly he seems to have a very high opinion of Joseph Bologna, made him concertmaster of this orchestra, uh, Every indication he was very impressed with this young man and uh, entrusted a lot of responsibility to him as a musician and, uh, you know, clearly saw his gifts. Now, we don't know what his first composition was, of course, but we do know what he published first. His opus one was a set of string quartets. This is in 1770. And these are nice, they're very fine pieces. What's more interesting to me, Evan, though, is that this is a string quartet, which was still a newish form at the time. There were quartets of strings and trios and things like that um, in centuries past, but 
talking about a set of two violins, viola and cello, that was slightly new. Haydn had just kind of popularized that in the the decade before. So his first composition, his first opus, something that's already kind of new. Right. And, you know, of course, Haydn over uh, another part of Europe is doing this in the 1750s, 1760s. Mm-hmm. And so I think Joseph Bologna is among the first French composers to be writing string quartets. I think so, too. So things are, are moving. It's now 1776. And this is when a big opportunity is presented to Bologna, but it goes um, in a very terrible direction, as we'll see. In 1776, he was nominated to lead the Paris Opera, but that was a position he never ended up getting, Evan, did he? Well, so apparently there were some members of the opera company who petitioned the Queen uh, saying, you know, oh, we can't possibly have this person be the director of our opera company because he's a mulatto. And it's very offensive to even use this word today, but he was a person with an African mother and a white father. And he had an appearance of a black person. He was a black person. And, uh, you know, he encountered this racism through his whole life. Obviously, they were people who supported him and believed in him. And and uh, given what's happening in Europe at this time with the Enlightenment and these ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity that are going to burst forth in the French Revolution at the end of the 1780s, that didn't come out of nowhere. But nevertheless, these these conflicting attitudes are definitely very much present in European culture, uh, also here in America too, of course, as we know. And uh, one of the ways in which uh, the very negative attitudes manifest themselves is he has this great opportunity to show forth his talents once again, and he's deprived of it, not because he's not good enough to do the job, but because people that are in positions of power don't like the way he looks. Terrible circumstances. And I understand, though, the queen... Mary Antoinette did like Bologna, and while he was denied this position in the opera, he would also be invited to Versailles and perform semi-frequently or at least more than once for the Queen. Yeah, it's not really clear exactly what her attitude was and why she didn't use her royal prerogative to have him appointed to the uh, lead the Paris Opera. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe she had her own political considerations, but uh, clearly she did think highly of him as a musician if she invited him to Versailles on multiple occasions to make music with her. And in fact, he would play his violin and she would be with him accompanying him on the keyboard. I can only imagine what that would be like. Just picturing that in your head, the Queen and Bologna playing together. Yeah, and apparently, I haven't. I, from what I've seen in the movie trailer, this is one of the things that we're going to see in the film. So it'll be interesting to see how that gets depicted. But, you know, when we see that on the screen, we know there's some basis of, of truth to it. Yes, that's a good point. Now, a lot of what he wrote was for the violin as a solo instrument, either with another violinist or with uh, accompaniment like piano or one of his many violin concertos, and this kind of makes sense. He plays the violin, he's a virtuoso on the instrument. Many composers, especially in the 18th century, they performed the concertos that they were were writing. And these concertos also, what I want people to really kind of take away from when listening to his music, is I feel he really kind of leans more back towards the Baroque period in his music and some of the ways he writes his music. I might out myself a little bit here, Evan, but there's not a lot of music from this time period, the later part of the 18th century, that I kind of find personally compelling. But I love the Baroque period and the Renaissance period and everything after this. So for me, it's much more interesting that we hear Bologna on this side of what we kind of call the classical era. Yeah, I think, you know, we have to bear in mind these categories that we love to throw around, classical and Baroque and so forth. They're not completely out of nowhere, but that's a way of thinking about the history of music. And there might be other ways as well that could be quite different. But what I would say with regards to that is that he is one of those composers who's not that easy to classify, that there are aspects of the music of his that has survived that sound very classical to us, that sound like the Mozart-Haydn tradition of music. But there's also this, as you said, this fantastical element of this virtuosic display that we would associate with music from earlier in the 18th century, from the Baroque period. And he's, I think, one of those composers who's maybe in some ways kind of a bridge figure. Of course, this is also leading up to the French Revolution and Romanticism and so forth. So I wonder the extent to which he's also presaging some of that in in his music. 
And his instruction he would have had growing up would have been in an earlier style than what would come, of course, the decades after, you know, sure. you know, for him as an adult. Moving forward a little bit, in 1778, this is so fascinating, Evan, Mozart and Bologna, I guess, were living under the same uh, roof on this estate. Mozart, though, was 11 years younger, and he was there with his mother, in Paris, and as we know from our Mozart episode, that's where his mother died. So right. I, I guess we don't see too much. I assume they ran into each other. Probably a huge estate. Maybe the age difference, and then different level of success at that point with Mozart being eleven years younger. Sure. Um, I wonder. I wonder what their interactions were like. I wondered that too, and uh, it's one of those many situations in the history of music where we know composers probably interacted, but we A, don't know for sure if they did, and B, if they did, we don't have any real clue about what may have transpired between them, but boy, to have been a fly on the wall. You know, there are people that call Joseph Bologna the Black Mozart, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, some people might say in response to that, well, maybe Mozart was the white Bologna. <laughs> you know, they were both quite brilliant in, in their own way, and it would have been wonderful if we could have been with them while they, if they encountered one another. Oh, if only. Around this time as well, he publishes two symphonies. This is 1779. So I guess here he's now in his um, later 30s. One is a symphony that's standalone. And then the second one that he published was actually used as the overture to the one surviving opera. And we're going to get, we're going to get into his opera in a little bit. But the overture to that surviving opera was basically like a short symphony. Fast movement, a slow movement, and then a fast movement. And he just published that as a symphony. That also, for me, that leans more towards the um, you know, earlier, more um, Baroque style, if you will. Well, this is again where we see him as a kind of a, maybe a bridge figure between Baroque classical romantic styles and this very old fashioned opera overture, like a Baroque opera overture, a multi-movement thing like we dissociate with a Handel opera. The early Mozart opera overtures have that quality. And of course, if you refer back to the symphony episode of Classical Breakdown a couple of seasons ago and how the symphony evolved, one of the antecedents of this, this, the symphony was the opera overture and this multi-movement suite that be kind of expanded into the sinfonia and how that sort of bridges over into the symphony. So it's there's some ambiguity about what we even call a symphony at this point in European history. Also this same year, another um, tragic event in Bologna's life in that he was attacked in the streets of Paris at night. There's different details, different accounts, some things are murky. One says that they were actually police officers of the day, and they were acting in retaliation perhaps for an affair that Bologna had with someone's wife that, I guess, resulted in, in a child. They were locked up. The officers were then released. Very eerie similarities, I think, to um, this century, but um, another terrible event uh, for Bologna. We're not entirely sure exactly what all the events were in this case. It appears that he had an affair with a married woman and that they had a child together, and that the child was then spirited away by the woman's husband, and the child died in infancy, and Joseph Bologna never got to meet his son, who died as a baby, and that uh, he was brokenhearted about the, uh, you know, this affair being brought to a, such a miserable end, and his child dying. Uh, but again, and, you know, is that why he was attacked, and, uh, you know, to what extent was racism a factor in this? It has to have been to some extent. Do we have all the facts straight about what happened and with whom? There's a lot of unanswered questions, but clearly something pretty terrible happening in his life at this point. Yeah. So he's still composing um, through all of this in the 1770s, and we get to another work here to show that, again, Evan, like you're saying, him thinking of him being this crossover composer between periods and styles. I think that, that that's happening here too with the uh, Sinfonia Contratante, a work that is sort of a symphony and sort of a concerto. Yeah. In the Baroque period, these two weren't seen as super separate. They kind of became separate as time went on here. And then there was this effort to kind of recombine them again in some way. And this was new. And this was something that Bologna was doing. And this is a, a genre that, as you said, emerged out of the Baroque, the sort of the concerto tradition, 
We think of uh, Sinfonia Contratante style pieces. Mozart wrote several that we still have as the sort of the standard concert repertoire today and uh, how this evolved into the 19th century. So again, this is where Bologna is sort of at the forefront of the evolving musical tastes and styles and genres. And this one for me in particular showcases what I love about Bologna's music. Whenever there's a moment where a soloist is kind of in a transition period themselves and they're being virtuosic, he does it in a way that to me sounds like he was just playing Bach partitas on his violin and then just started composing. What I just kind of call, for a lack of a better term, just these fantastical Baroque moments that inject yeah. so much energy and excitement. Basically, it's like if you think of Mozart, a nice sing-songy transition, like an aria, of course, Mozart, an opera composer. Bologna, not quite in that direction, but then very rhythmic with the transition, very um, much digging into the harmony of the music rather than the, the linear aspect of, um, of a line. Don't always compare to Mozart, but for this time period, I think um, it kind of makes sense. And then a moment after this, or before, the music sounds very classical, very buttoned up and nice and tidy. Right. So again, that that combination of styles, the very virtuosic, mm-hmm. you know, clearly this is a, a music composed by a violin virtuoso, someone who had a reputation for being a stupendously gifted mm-hmm. violinist. To what extent was he writing music for himself to play that he could show off uh, his amazing talents? And yet he's also able to fit into this, as you said, this more buttoned down, more restrained classical style that we hear with other composers of that era. And I think we hear especially this fantastical element on display in uh, the cadenzas of his concertos. Yes. And we'll get into his Joseph Haydn connection right after this. This is something, Evan, that I did not know actually until I think just the other week, that Bologna was responsible for getting us these Paris symphonies, as we call them, a set of symphonies that Joseph Haydn wrote and premiered in Paris The orchestra that he was conducting, Bologna that is, it folded in 1781, a new opportunity arose, and through this orchestra and through Marie Antoinette, Bologna commissioned Haydn for these symphonies. Yeah, I think the connection was actually not with uh, Marie Antoinette as much as it was with uh, Philippe, the Duke of Orléans, Mm. Uh, and uh, that was someone very in a very powerful position in French society at the time, who was another very strong supporter of Joseph Bologna as a musician and as a friend. And uh, uh, when the orchestra, the Le Concert des Amateurs, folded. The Duke of Orléans helped to finance this new orchestra. A lot of the musicians in the other orchestra that had disbanded joined this new orchestra, which was through a Masonic lodge that Philippe, the Duke of Orléans, belonged to. This was a, a, a means by which uh, Joseph Bologna was able to continue to support himself and to compose and to perform. And uh, it was through that connection that he was able to commission these symphonies from Franz Josef Haydn, which we know as the Paris symphonies. And that orchestra was the first to ever play them. It's just another moment that we don't have. I imagine Haydn had to interact with Bologna on some level, either by Haydn just being there for the performances or also there for the um, the rehearsals, not just the premiere. Was there any um, feedback or, or anything like that? Or at least they said hi or something backstage or something. Yeah, or even just corresponding through through writing or, yeah. you know, we don't really know how they interacted. But what a great opportunity for Haydn. Paris, of course, one of the great musical capitals of Europe in this mm-hmm. era. Haydn gets this commission from this composer or violinist who has a reputation for excellence. So, of course, Haydn must have been very excited by this opportunity, a great opportunity for him. And uh, Bologna, of course, uh, to have this very well-respected composer writing music for his orchestra, it was a win-win situation. These two great musical minds coming together in this way, it's just an incredibly exciting thing to think about. Oh, yeah. What is pretty interesting is that a few years after this, in 1785, he is, uh, what, like 40 years old now, he stops writing He stops composing instrumental works in this year, and then he switches fully over to to opera. And this is where it's just so terrible what happened with a Paris opera, because I wonder what would it have been like for Bologna 
had he gotten that job. I imagine he would have stayed there for um, quite a while. He probably would have raised the level of the group the same way he did with the uh, other ones he was working with. And we probably have a lot more operas from him. He wrote six. Only one survives in full. And then there's like a moment or two from uh, like two others. Right. So all this great music that uh, he wrote in his maturity is lost to us. And that really, I really feel that loss very keenly. Yeah. I, I sort of suspect, from what I've been able to hear from his operas, unfortunately, maybe some of his most convincing or impactful music lies in his operas. There's an aria that survives uh, from one. We're hearing it sung now by San Marino. That is just, is so, it's just so exciting. And there's so much going on, and it's just, it, it hooks you. And it's, uh, yeah, it's terrible we don't have more. Yeah. But a few days after this episode comes out, there is a new recording of the only opera that we do have, La Mante Anonyme, if I can say that right, The Anonymous Lover. So we'll have a full commercial recording of at least that one available in, um, in just a few days after this comes out. Yeah, and like I said, it was performed by the Los Angeles Opera in, uh, I think, 2020. So this is something that the whole world is newly rediscovering. And now we'll get to what is the later part of his life, Evan, and where things just get more confusing. And this is interesting because we often talk about composers and how little we know about their early life. And sometimes a little bit at the end, we it gets really murky at this point as he enters into his mid-40s. He's involved in the French uh, Revolution and then um, something else. He gets maybe more involved in military. There's just so many things that are confusing about this time for him. Yeah, at some point he becomes commissioned as a colonel and leads a, uh, a battalion or, or some military unit, which actually uh, took on the nickname of uh, Saint-Georges because of him. But, uh, you know, that doesn't seem to have ended well, or it's not really clear what military actions they were involved in. Uh, it appears he might have been kicked out for being accused of mishandling government funds or spending too much time on music. But again, there's, there's A, there's things that I haven't learned yet about him, and B, I think there are things that are just not clear from the records that we do have. That's a good point. There's what... We don't know, and what, what we don't know yet, because if we think about the Florence Price episode and how much we've learned about her since, um, since 2009 even, and in the last two years since that episode on her, so many recordings have come out. There's so many recordings and works that I'm discovering now because they weren't available earlier. I'm hoping we see that trend continue with Bologna Maybe more works found, maybe more details, documents. I mean, there's all kinds of records that he must be in, in some way, either as military or or whatever. And with a new recording of his survive, only surviving opera coming out and this film coming out, and plus this episode that you and I are making right now, I hope more and more people will be interested because he's worth knowing, worth knowing more about this fascinating and talented figure. Yes. And after this extraordinary life and what a time to be alive um, for Bologna in this way. He dies a few years later in 1799 at age 53. And even just the evidence of his death was kind of dramatic Evan. Apparently, the um, all the certificates and records of that, they were all lost in a fire. Sure. Like so many other records from that era. And mm. uh, the, apparently there was some death certificate or some record that said that he was 60 when he died, but we know that's not correct. So right. even, even at the time, there was some confusion about his life and his death. Yes. So we are going to put a playlist on the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org of um, his music. And also we'll put the new recording of the, um, the new opera recording that's coming out there as well and anything else we can find. And hopefully we'll know more in five years than we know now. The more we can learn, the better. So now it's time to read your reviews from Apple Podcasts. What do we have, Evan? Lady LS left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, gets right to the point, left a heart eyes emoji and said, love it, exclamation point. I love that. Five stars, short and sweet, and even an emoji. Thank you, Lady LS. Thank you so much. And that's it for me on Bologna. And do you have anything else, Evan? Again, this is a figure about whom we're still just beginning to learn more as uh, interest in him grows. And I hope that the whole world will become more and more curious 
and more and more interested in, to learn about this remarkable individual. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown, your guide to classical music. For more information on this episode, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. You can send me comments and episode ideas to classicalbreakdown at weta.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, leave a review in your podcast app and tell a friend. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from WETA Classical.